is that I deal a lot with editors and without fail, ask editors, what are the issues you're dealing with? Even with really talented writers, even with writers, you already paid millions for their books. What are the things that keep, that keep coming up that as an editor, you have to deal with? Sometimes you're surprised you still have to deal with it. And these are some of the things that they come up with. Things that I certainly, none of these that I learned in creative writing class. All the mads I learned trial by error um, on the job or with really, really patient editors. So let's talk about them. Seven things I did not learn in a creative writing class. The first one is pacing. Um, one of the reasons why you don't hear pacing a lot in classes is because pacing is really hard to teach. Um, pacing is something that unless that teacher is, that teacher, that professor, that reader is with you as you write all your, you know, all your poems, all your stories, the, going from page 100 to 200 to 300 to how many hundreds of pages, unless they're there with you writing it, it's hard to teach you pacing. Um, but what does pacing mean? You know, I am, um, there are a lot of things I could say about Jonathan Franzen, very few of them good. Um, but um, his novel, The Corrections, is a marvel of pacing. And when something is paced really well, you will stay along even if it's not technically brilliant. Like a lot of genre fiction, a lot of genre fiction is brilliant. A lot of genre fiction is formula. Agatha Christie is not a brilliant writer, but she enters the realm of brilliant writers because nobody has ever done pacing as great as Agatha Christie does it. And despite she has written some, some pretty terrible novels, but she's also a master at pacing. What happens next? How do we move forward? What is it that gets you to turn that page? I read ton, actually that's not true. I actually finish reading few books. If I get through the end of the year reading nine books, that's a record. So I will complete reading maybe nine books a year. I start 200. Well, rarely do I, and, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm too damn old. I'm too old to go all the way through with a stupid book or a boring book. Um, books that make it to the end. I was um, reading um, Tommy Orange's There, There, which I blurbed, and I was very tempted. I'm like, dude, I'm really tempted to write, I really finish this one as your blurb. Um, because it's, 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 um, that novel also is, a, it's, it's, a, is a, it's masterful in how it's paced. Um, does anybody ever read, uh, read Shirley Jackson? Shirley Jackson wrote this really controversial short story, The Lottery. And she has a fantastic novel called We've Always Lived in the Castle. And We've Always Lived in the Castle um, is expertly paced because what's so great about it is that it manages to hold you to the end. Like um, the right people who write murder mysteries already know this. Yeah. How do you keep... You know, the story going to the end. Um, a lot of, uh, if, if, if those of you who have um, found anybody involved in detective work or police work, they'll tell you that, and, you know, the average detective case, you know, the average detective case doesn't take um, 10 episodes of a series. That doesn't take months. Most detective cases are solved the day they get it. Um, you know, so, for, so if knowing that, how do you do a 300-page detective story? Um, you know, it's pacing. And what do we mean by pacing? It's a lot of things. One is how much are you showing and when do you show it? Um, how long till we get to a plot resolution? Those uh, are some of your storylines resolved on page one, are some resolved on page 50, are some resolved on page 200. How do you go about, how do you go about um, deciding what happens in what section of the book? So it, 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 it also, it depends on, on um, how do you set those revelations out? How long do you delay something happening? Can you de deepen tension so that we don't learn something right off, you know, right away? The last thing you want is somebody pick up your novel and within five pages, they know exactly what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, Carlos Fuentes says the worst kind of story is the one that ends exactly as you planned it to. 
So, so one thing to think about with your, when you're writing your stories is, are you being surprised? Some of us are very, very careful plotters. There's nothing wrong with carefully plotting a story. But when was the last time something in your own story you went, I didn't see that coming? So if it's not, if it's not an ongoing su surprise or a change of direction and so on for you, then it won't be for the reader. So what it mean, what other things that means? It means you can't get comfortable with your writing. Your own writing is supposed to unnerve you. Your own writing is supposed to disturb you. Um, when was the last time, for example, your hero, heroine, your protagonist made a bad choice? You know, did something really wrong or just made a mistake? And a mistake that has consequences and a mistake that throws your story off guard. Because one of the things that you have to do when you're writing these stories and when you're writing um, characters that become people, remember people do two things we don't expect. People surprise and people disappoint. Chances are if you, you, if you expect your brother to disappoint you, if you know he's going to let you down, then it's not really a disruption when he does. If you know you can't trust your friend because they're always late, it's not a disruption when they're late because you've been planning for it. So well, what? it's when they surprise you and when they disappoint you that that come, changes the story. So what are the ways in which your characters disappoint you? What are the ways you can make your characters surprise you? And sometimes that means letting go of what you're holding precious to your own story. Nine times out of ten, you're the person standing in the way of your own good story. You're the person standing in the way of your, char your, char your novel being great because you have this very sort of set idea. And the problem with that, of course, again, is that the pacing can be off. What does pacing mean? It means a five-minute scene can take 20 pages. Um, in one of my novels, there's a scene that takes place in five minutes, and the entire page count was 331 pages. And the entire scene takes place in five minutes. And then the next paragraph is 20 years, and I wrote it in one paragraph. The, think about how much time is elapsing in the scenes you're writing and vary it. You know, one scene can take, a set of 10 pages can cover 100 years of your character. The next 10 pages can cover 15 seconds. And what is it, what are you doing to the story when you're compressing this part, expanding this part, compressing this part, expanding this part? What you're doing is that you're varying the way in which people respond to your story. Um, does everything have to happen in the present tense? So the next paragraph be five weeks after the person said this. So, you know, tomorrow in a story doesn't have to be the day after. Tomorrow in a story can be 10 years after. Tomorrow in a story can be one week after. One of the things you'll find with pacing that helps are two things, gaps and leaps. What's a gap? A gap is a chunk you cut out of your story to just move to the next point. Do you have to write, say, A lead to B, lead to C, lead to D, lead to E, when you can go A to F, then G, H, Y, then Z. So one of, a thought experiment you should try with your story is think of those of you who are already writing. Say you, fin you finished a paragraph, you finished a chapter yesterday, or you're about to finish a chapter. Something to consider, what if the next chapter starts five years later? What does that do for your story? Firstly, it means somebody's alive. Somebody might be dead. The consequences in your, the chapter you wrote last night might have played out in a different way. The, thing, the other thing it does for the reader is it's a head swing. It's, it's, it's a, what the, oh my God, what just happened here? It keeps the reader on their toes. It keeps you as a writer on your toes. Because one, if you jump five years, you have to tell us what's going on five years later. Five years later, somebody might be married. Somebody might be dead. Somebody might have done something worse than they did before. Somebody might have gotten better. Maybe your drug addict character 
actually got clean and is clean for five years. Or maybe he's dead and now it turns out you have a new lead character. Has anybody ever seen the film Psycho? Psycho shocked audiences in 1960. That was my biggest time travel, my time travel dream. My biggest time travel dream is to be in the audience in 1960 when they first saw Psycho. Because to kill off the main character midway in the film, left people going, what, what did you just do? What, what are we going to do now? There are people actually thought, do, do we leave? <laughs> but the film's still going on. What, what are we going to do? Because that's a jump in the story. That's a gap in the story. And, when the main, and, and the main character didn't survive the jump. So what I'm saying is, what it, it, to, to, one of the things that, 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 that your story may need is a gap. And let the readers fill in the gap. Um, I'm trying to think of a story that does this really, really well. Em um, Forster says another called "The Longest Journey," where these characters are playing cricket, and the whole storyline is about how Gerald is just kind of a jerk to his friends, and they're just and and you know they they're like, "Oh, Gerald, you're you're a rat, you're 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 too mischievous, whatever." And then the next page says, "Gerald died that afternoon." Yeah, um, Henry James, when he read that, was appalled. He's like, you can't do that in a story. Things must happen organically. Ian Farr says, like, screw that. I wanted him dead. Um, so th what I'm saying is, is that gap in the story um, is what made the reader, it, it, it sort of flipped the reader's wig. And it, they wanted to know what the hell happened. What did I miss? So one of the things that we as human beings have we all have it is an incurable case of FOMO. You know, we all have a fear of missing out. And if in the novel something happened and we go, oh shit, did we just miss out? We scramble. We want to know what happened. We want to jump forward and go, how are they dealing with this? We want to jump backward and go, how did this happen? So that's a gap. Um, then there's a leap. Actually, no, I'm, I'm suddenly doing the both at the same time. A gap is when you cut something out. A leap is when you jump the story forward. What I find with students sometimes is that they're too obsessed with transition. They feel every, every scene must lead into the next scene, must evolve into the next scene, must unfold into this scene. No, it doesn't. Sometimes you can't just jump to the next scene. Yeah. The very best stories do that. They jump, they leap. So, um, so, so what are we saying about pacing? How much do you leave? How much do you jump forward? Um, how much of the story is shown? How much are you revealing? What are you going to tell me today? What are you going to tell me tomorrow? What are you going to tell me in 10 years? And when you find out that you solved all of that, you solve the problem of pacing. Is everybody hearing me? Not yeah, because since my connection is unstable. So, um, yeah. Uh, if anybody didn't hear anything, just unmute and just tell me to repeat it. Because that's the problem with my, my bunker internet. Um, and with pacing, the second thing that I didn't learn in creative writing class is momentum. How does momentum work? Your, let's see, let's pick a, a thriller plot. The, 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 the character is in a chase and um, the character is in a car crash and they're lying in a pool of blood. God, this got really dark really quick. And um, lying in a pool of blood and there he starts to think about what led him to this point. Now, what's the problem with that? The problem was well, considering that is one of the things that is one of the hallmarks of fiction, the flashback, the reminiscence, the memory. Um, you're about to head to a, country, a whole new journey, a new country, and the person at the airport stops to think of what led them there. On paper, that doesn't sound like a bad thing. And some stories are almost all flashbacks. The problem with a flashback or the, the, the challenge you're going to have with a flashback is be very careful that the most exciting parts of your story have already happened. 
two things happen when you're writing a flashback. One, it's not movement. This is how your story is moving. A flashback is moving that way. So no matter how exciting your flashback is, you're still moving backwards. What happens sometimes when we're writing is the present tense of the story is not as interesting as the flashback. If the flashback is about the time I was taken hostage on a flight and how did we survive, and the present tense is you sitting down drinking a Coke, your story is basically person drinks Coke and thinks a lot. That's your plot. Your plot isn't how I survive a hijacking. Your plot is person takes drink and thinks. Now, if you're Nicholson Baker, you can actually make a story out of that because he has stories that are, that's exactly what they do and they're remarkable stories. But the, 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 the momentum of your story is not going forward. Your momentum is going that way. Well, or, or, or what is happening is the reader is on pause because the character is on pause. If you're sitting down in the, on a park bench and you're remembering the most exciting day of your life, Inside your mind is a carnival. Outside, we're just watching somebody sitting down on a bench. And when you write a flashback, don't think the reader ever loses sight that in the present tense, your character is not doing anything. What does that mean? It means you have to pay attention to the present. It means what's going on in the present tense of your story must be as interesting as what they're remembering or else, why not just go back to the memory? So if all your character is doing is, say, slowly bleeding out, but the memory is something fantastic, just why not just do the memory? If your flashback is more interesting than your present, maybe your flashback is the present. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if... if, if, if um, you know, if, if the, the, the memory of the story, my dog is being retrieved. If the memory of this, if the memory, if the memory or the flashback or the thing that happen, has already happened is more exciting than what is going on, set it where it's more exciting. Sometimes we, I think we, we, we have, a, we, not sabotage, but we hijack our own stories. We have a certain present tense when you know you really want to talk about 10 years ago. Your character is an adult, but every time you write about them, something happening as a child, your story just comes alive. So set the story when the person is a child. I also, in, when we're writing, not particularly writing novels or long narratives, we all feel we must do this thing where we must establish it. We must set the, sta set the stage, set the tone, build these little things, and then the excitement will come. My, ex my advice is always start at the excitement. <coughs> start at the crisis. Um, oh, sorry. Oh. sorry. I'm trying to get back into the talking a lot thing. Yeah. Um, Flannery O'Connor well, so I have very few good things to say about, but I will say this. She has a story called um, A Good Man is Hard to Find, and it starts with a line, the grandmother didn't want to go to Florida. And I'm going to come back to that line in another, another point coming up, but I'm going to talk about it here in terms of pacing, because what, what, it does, what that does is that it immediately sets a problem. It doesn't do this sort of calm build up and then she goes I don't want to go. There's nothing wrong with that. But consider what happens when your story begins with the problem. You know? It's, it's, it already, the pace is already up here. So this is, I don't want to, it's so like I'm giving you hard and fast rules. There are lots of writers who can really do the slow burn very well. Hilary Mantel is a master of the slow burn. Yeah, Melville is a master of the slow burn. Toni Morrison is a master of the slow burn. People who can, who have to build, who build up that story to that, that crescendo. So, um, but just, you know, to, 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 to wrap off on, on momentum, just always, be, always consider what is the present tense of your story 
What is the forward momentum? And is the present tense moving as interesting as the memory or the flashback? And if it's not, you got two choices. Beef up your present tense. Set something that's as interesting in the, in the moment. Or consider that your flashback is actually your story. Or your memory is actually your story. My second novel was originally set in 1838. And um, I kept going back to 1801 so much that eventually I just stopped and set the novel in 1801. And that's when the novel happened. It, 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 that's when it, it kind of, I won't say poured out to me because every novel is, uh, is a nightmare. For, nightmare, it's a struggle, and I scream every day and wonder why the hell am I doing it. That said, that one, <laughs> there was less screaming after I figured that out that the flashback that I really liked a lot was the story. So I'll pull it back and, and, and that's how you get it. So that's momentum. That's only two of the things so far. The third one is pulse. Another term which I have never heard in a creative writing class. I think some people are just joining us. Um, if you have video, it'd be great to see you. So I don't feel like I'm talking to gray screens, but you can leave your mics on mute. And I'm going to drink some more from this really ugly looking water bottle. So we said pacing, momentum. The third thing I did not learn in a creative writing class is pulse. What do I mean about pulse? Monitoring the pulse of your story. Those of you, some of you may have heard me talk about this before. Um, if you've been in um, other classes with me. Um, what I, I always give with, with, um, with pulse is monitor the pulse of your story, particularly, sorry, the pulse of your language, particularly your verbs. You know, verbs are the backbone of your story. Verbs are the, verbs are, you know, the verbs are the, the secret weapon in a sentence. So when I say monitoring your pulse, I'm talking monitoring your story at the sentence, at the sentence level. Um, one, exa one, one experiment I give, I give, um, students and even writers is think about a verb think about um a verb or a noun and when i'm as you think about this verb or noun think about how sensory it is does this verb have weight does it does it has does it have a does it uh, does it some weight space does that look a certain way does it smell a certain way what kind of evocative detail do i get from this thing you're describing me and then I give, say, so pick up, you know, look at the words individually and score it. I say, like, if five from one to five, I give you a word, one to five, and um, five being it's the most evocative sensory word you could think of, one or zero meaning I get nothing from it. So if I say, for example, um, whisper, you know, a whisper is like a four. Because it, it decreases volume. A shout is also like a four because it increases volume. Um, you know, it's it's um, explode, um, you know, stamp, um, lacerate. You know, these are verbs that when I say them, something is coming off in your head. So if, say, lacerate is a five, and stamp is a four. What is decide? Decide something. <laughs> yeah. What is um, consider? Yeah. Manage. Yeah. Choose. Maintain. So if your character finally escaped from the bad guy, why would your sentence be she managed to escape? It's telling us it's, it's not incorrect. It just has to have zero energy. Managed to escape doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't tell us that they break through the door. It doesn't tell us that they climb through the window. It doesn't tell us that the window was too high and they had to make a leap. It doesn't tell us that they landed in the garbage. It doesn't tell us that the garbage smelled terrible. It doesn't tell us that the garbage may have saved her. It just said she managed. 
Say again, else, what did the person do today that was exciting? Oh, I managed. And, uh, you know, think of but the other thing that, that um, I'm trying to remember what's the name of it because we do it all the time. And I can't remember the actual name, and, and uh, you know, you, which is terrible since I'm an English teacher. But there are also verbs that do not have action. And we don't see sometimes that we end up falling into inactive verbs. Look at this, for example. He is the last of his kind. It sounds like a perfectly rational, reasonable sentence. Except what's the verb in it? That character is not being last. That character is not being the last of his kind. You know what that character is doing in that sentence? He is ising. He was found alone. That character is not being found. That character is wasing. What did you do today? I was. What am I going to do tomorrow? I'm going to is for a little bit. It's a, uh, it's a verb that has no action. It's a verb. It's a sentence that he is the last left alive is a powerful sentence that's doing nothing. There's some powerful information in it, but you, 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 you killed it with an inactive verb. That's what I'm saying about the pulse of your story. Also, think of things that, that um, you know, think about things that erase a pulse of a story. For example, filter, filters. What's a filter? A filter is something that comes between a character and the action. I could see rain is falling. Rain is, we're not watching the rain falling. We're not even watching you seeing it. We're watching you cutting. That's the main thing that's happening there. You're cutting in the story. I could see the rain is falling. The most, everything is hinging on could. And could, does, why don't I just say the rain was falling? Or better yet, describe what kind of rain. Is it heavy rain? Is it light rain? Is it warm rain? Is it thunderous rain? Did the rain come out of nowhere? Is the rain gentle on the rooftops? Is it sound like the type of rain that would be gentle on the roof, but you don't have a roof? So I'm saying that the, the words that come in, in between the, action, the, 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 the subject and the action kill, you know, kills the energy of your story. And you so watch for, watch for um, rational people. Hold on, say my connection is unstable. Let me wait. You still hearing me? All right, I'm going to repeat that. Um, or just find a better computer. Uh, yeah, that's a problem with being in, in a bunker. I got a bunker's internet. Um, what was I saying? Um, oh, uh, um, as, you know, as, as writers and as thinkers, sometimes we can't help but think too much. And few things kill writing more than thinking too much. Um, I always say there's too much thinking going on in fiction. There's too much thinking going on. Characters, our characters spend so much time thinking that they're not doing anything much in a story. And one of the problems with that is you can get something that has a rational sense of what you're trying to say, but it has no weight to it. For example, here's a sentence. I will overturn that unjust verdict. Or better yet, no, but even worse than that. I will challenge that unjust verdict. The message of the sentence is clear. This judgment was unfair and I'm gonna challenge it. But what, what kind of mental image goes off in your head by the sentence? I will challenge this unjust verdict. Every single word in that sentence is an absolute physical to a challenge. A challenge, you don't even have to do anything physical to challenge anybody. Unjust compared to what? Verdict, okay. What I'm saying is it's a sentence that conveys information but conveys no sensory detail. Compare that to a line in The Crucible where the character says, I will fall like an ocean in this court. Suddenly, we have weight, we have space. This is like a thunderous thing. He's going to drop an ocean in this court. 
It implies weight. It implies space. It implies, it implies he's going to wash away all of you. He could have said, I'm going to obliterate his court. And obliterate is a nice verb, nice verb. But it's not like I'm going to drop like an ocean in this court. In Pulp Fiction, there's a scene in it where Marcella says he's going to have his revenge. And he could have just said, I will have my revenge. Eh. Instead, he says, I'm going to get medieval on their ass. There's something that comes from medieval. And when you hear medieval, you think a whole bunch of, of, of Middle Ages torture implements. You're suddenly thinking of racking somebody over a bed of coals. Just by one word, I'm going to get medieval. What, what happens there is medieval, or I will drop like an ocean, has weight, it has space, it has texture, it gives it energy. Um, something like I say, people here are serving different interests. All right. It's not the same as somebody's wagging the dog. Oh, that's kind of a cliche, but you get my point. That um, what is the sentence? Look at the sentences, especially your sentences that are carrying so much emotion. Your sentences that are carrying so much weight, do they, do they have sensory detail? Um, your sentences should smell. Uh, you know, I teach a class, a, 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 literature, class, a literature class called 9-11 and the novel. And the first question I ask on the first day of class, and it always stumps the class, is what do you think 9-11 smelled like? Another exercise I give students, and y'all look here on Zoom or I'd have given it to you, is I walk into my grandmother's room using only sense of smell, tell me she's Republican. Or even a better one, I've been blind all my life. Explain red. What are you going to tell me? It's a vibrant color. I'm blind. I don't know what vibrant means. So you, what do you find out? You have to let go of the rational. You have to let go of everything you think that makes sense. You know who answers that question brilliantly every time and do it tonight if, you have, if you're near one? A six-year-old. Or any kid, anybody between, anybody between four and ten can answer that question brilliantly. It's adults who can't answer it. So I asked my nephew, what is red? And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm blind. Explain to me what is red. And he says, well, I would say, I would say like pink is pink. But red is red. He's like, there you go. That's a, a four-year-old. Of course, a four-year-old can understand it. Four-year-olds, they're still in tune with their imaginations. We're the ones who think we're adult because we let go of them. The best thing you can do for yourself as a writer is never grow up. But well, to come back to it, that that red the way he the the, the, the my four year old if you did it that has a pulse that has energy so think of of things that sap the energy of your sentences think of things that boost it three things that sap energy you can write them down abstractions abstractions are not your friend abstractions are anything that conveys a value that has no sensory quality like say affection i showed my puppy affection this morning we don't care you know i brush my paper i brush my dog's fur you know or i scratched him behind the neck behind the ears or so on so abstractions love affection success um generalizations another enemy of yours that you may not know is an enemy What's the generalization, of course? It's a grouping of things that can't be grouped, like results or people. The third one that's getting in the way of your energy is judgment calls. Pretty is a judgment. She was pretty. We don't know what that means. He was fast. We don't know what that means. Fast for... A race car driver is not the same as fast for a snail. For a snail, everything is fast. 
So if I say something like the big muscular horse ran quickly, that's not telling us anything. What can, what's a big muscular horse? Is it a Clydesdale? Is it a thoroughbred? Why big and muscular? That's two adjectives. And 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 a, and a, you know a quick tip: if you're if you're if you've gone past two adjectives, you're in trouble, because it means you're not capturing what's really what you really want to say. The big muscular horse ran quickly. Why not the thoroughbred galloped, or the stallion galloped? Three, three words, more evocative sentence. So it's, it's, it's going in and, and look at the ways in which So your connections on so tape. which your own words are stopping the energy of your you know the energy of your story. Adverbs I go back and forth on. I my rule it um okay, that was on civil. Did anybody hear what I was saying about adverbs? I'm gonna just repeat it just in case. I'm sorry my internet is so bad, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um what I was saying about about adverbs is an adverb is a modifier of a sentence and we use them all the time but if you can find a strong verb a strong verb would always beat an adverb a strong noun would always beat an adjective i was saying my rule with adverbs is use them all you want as long as your name is alan hollinghurst if you're not alan hollinghurst no <laughs> Yeah. I also have a rule that you get one exclamation sign for every 300,000 words. So make sure you use it wisely because you're not getting any more. <laughs> All right. Um, I may not rush through fast, especially with this such spotty internet. You know, let me talk about um, pulse. As I said, the pulse of your story, the energy. Pulse is from the heart. And heart, don't even think of another thing that you don't learn in in creative writing, muscle. And what do I mean by muscle? How physical is your story? You know, we're dealing with words. The great thing about dealing with film is people can watch that. The great thing about dealing with music is people can listen to that. We only have words. So our words have to be physical. Our words have to have muscle. Um, there's a line in George Orwell's, no, it's not a novel, it's a book of essays called Down and Out in Paris and London, where he talks about dishes. Not even people, he's talking about, he's talking about dishes in a sink. And he says, dishes stuck together in their grease. He could have just said dirty dishes, but stuck together. Um, the idea of... He's back. Come here. Come here, Max. Oh, all right. He's all right. He's around here somewhere. It's my diva dog. Um, yeah. Stuck together in Greece. It's tactile. It's visually precise. It's, um, are you using a proper noun? I always say, give, instead of vague plural, give me a single specific. When we're writing, sometimes we think we're more universal by being vague. Don't cross the line from mysterious into vague. Mysterious makes us want to know more. So in the story, the geranium, it's he was waiting on the geranium. Well, what the hell does that mean? Geranium is a flower. It's a color. Why are you waiting on a flower? I'm intrigued. I want to know what, what is that all about? It's not the same as he was waiting on the thing. Uh, it's, 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 um, it's, it's the specifics that do it. When I was, uh, my first novel, I had a line where the character says a bird flew in his face. And, uh, my editor asked me what bird, what, what bird was it? I was like, it don't matter. It's a bird. It don't matter which bird. It's a bird. And I said, but which one is it? What is in your head? What bird was it? And I said, it was a dove. I says, think of all imp the implications that people are going to have if a dove flew into somebody's face attacking them. Isn't, dove, isn't the dove the bird of peace? 
So no, when a dove is attacking you, no, I got questions that I didn't have before when it just said the bird flew in his face. No, I got questions. Like, but people aren't supposed to act that way. You know, it's the man picked up the, the man picked up the briefcase is never going to be as interesting as Harry picked up the briefcase. He was going somewhere, not the same as Dr. Johnson looked like he was going somewhere. What are the specifics you can give me? Um, if you ever read, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Um, Arundhati Roy is the god of small things. One well, the interesting thing about that novel, and an interesting book to read with it, is um, The Perfect Storm by Sebastian Unger. And what those two writers have in common is everything in their stories is doing something. There is no book, there's no, you really come across a, a sentence beginning with there was, or it was. There was a shout. No, somebody shouted. There was a sound. Something is making that sound. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, a tree in the yard. Is the tree just, there is a tree in the yard or is the tree growing in the yard? Is the tree standing in the yard? Is the tree swaying in the breeze? Is the tree, is the, are the roots of the tree boring down and breaking up your plumbing? There is nothing, is nothing, there's no such thing as a still object. There's no such thing as a passive action, except for how we write it. And I'm sure you've been hearing about passive voice since you were all in elementary school. So I don't have to go into passive voice versus active voice, except to say, say, how much physicality do your words smell? Do your words stink? Or do they smell like perfume? Um, what's the air like? When you're going somewhere, it's not just air. Air is, is it sour? Is it fresh? Even fresh air, it's a cliche, but fresh air beats air. So I'm saying everything has, everything has a, a sensory quality to it. One of the tricks that Sebastian Unger does, and he will deny it if you bring it up, but he totally does it, is he always gets all five senses down within the first 50 words. So when a reader says, it felt like I was there, what they don't realize is the reason why it feels like you were there is that all five of your senses were unlocked. So consider when you're entering this paragraph, what am I smelling? What am I seeing? And come on, Max, my dog's barking. You know what? Here, grab that. I carry treats to keep him quiet. <laughs> um, what are the what are the 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 the, the sensory de details that I'm getting? Sight, smell, touch, taste, sound. Um, you know, we know what we, we, we know what a car we know we, we know what's a car smell like. What does a new car smell? You know, tell us. You know, uh, um, and and the other thing about it too is that you can do the opposite. You can also withhold a sense. Um, Stendhal, the the novelist from the eight, the the eighteen hundreds, the eighteen hundreds, had this thing where every time, not every time, but most of the time when he wrote a war scene, he cut the sound. Why do you think he did that? A battle scene, guns are blasting, cannons are blasting. People are screaming. All these things are going. And what he does, he cuts the sound. So anybody want to guess that? Why cut the sound in a battle scene? Yeah. Um, Here we go and yell as if you're in class. Katie. Uh, maybe so it's louder in their heads. Mm-hmm. What? Sorry? Um. Like, yeah, something that you can imagine how loud it is. So it sort of adds to the suspense and fear and like the absence of sound makes it sound louder in your mind. Like you mm -hmm. were reading or, or I don't know. Yeah. Anybody else? A war scene. Why cut the sound? War is so loud. Why cut the sound? I think it also. Um, oh, sorry. No problem. You can go um, ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I think that it also. Um, 
questions like within the character like if the character is deaf or mm-hmm. did they lose their hearing like it causes a lot of different questions that keep you inside of the story for me mm-hmm. like when you take it away and i know that it's there i'm like wait what's happening to this character why aren't they hearing anything that's my mm-hmm. first question right yeah absolutely anybody else somebody um, else is- it yeah. would make me pay attention to the other details going on. Mm-hmm. Also, yeah, you're, you're all correct. And Beer Man, if you, if, um, you know, I don't know if any of you guys have, have, have um, experienced combat. I haven't. But, um, but as soon as that first explosion happens on the battlefield, you're deaf for the next 10 minutes. Um, so you have no choice but to depend on all your senses. Anybody who's been in combat can tell you, um, you know, or even, a, even an exercise. Um, once that first or second explosion, you're pretty much deaf as for the next, certainly the next 10 minutes for the next 100 meters that you're going to run. So what does that mean? It means, it means your, your, your vision is frantic because you can't hear. You have to know, look for an enemy. You have to look for the bomb. You have to look for such and such. The, 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 the panic that happens in that scene happens because they have cut the the, the 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 bomb has cut your sound so you don't always have so what i'm saying are two things that might seem contradictory one unlock the senses to make us feel we're there but you can hide back a sense to increase the tension um in margaret atwood's it, there's a scene in margaret atwood's um cat's eye where we come across a level where there are snakes what, should, what, we, what we smell them. What does that do for a scene when you're in a room and you can't see where the snakes are, you're just smelling that they're nearby? Think of a scene where you can't see the threat in the room, but you smell something is different. It's, it's, that, it's that physical detail that's giving you a kind of immediacy that wouldn't be there otherwise. It's the taking away of a sense. It's like um, classic classic trope in a in a in a in a, de- in a detective or investigation story. You finally corner the villain. The villain knock, ter- turns out the light, knocks out the light. No, we're in darkness. That it's the taking away of of that sense. And I'm going to come back to that darkness for another point that I have, but. Um, I don't want to take up too much time, although I think we, because I think we already passed, almost passed an hour, and I don't want to spend too much time um, with me just talking. I'm sure you have questions. The, 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 for, thing, well, fifth thing that I didn't learn, seduction. And I don't mean in that corny way in which before we could just kick them out with me too behaves. I don't mean in that's your story. How is your poem? How is even your nonfiction? Hold on, somebody said we lost you. Is everybody hearing me? All right, let me make sure. Oh, I was, I was um, yeah, I was um, checking. Okay, yeah, you can do, oh, that's why I wasn't seeing the message. I was on, I wasn't on everyone. Okay, let's just click this so that I'm seeing it. Let's open, I'm gonna open the chat window bigger so that I can see more. Um, how about, here we go. All right. I'm gonna keep my chat here. Yeah, feel free to text me so I can repeat a point. Um, um, but everybody's hearing me now, kind of. Yeah, I, um, you know what? I'm going to try a 5G connection. So I'm going to be out for a little bit, but I'll, I'll see if it works better. So bear with me. It's going to go offline for a little bit. Uh, one sec.
Can anybody hear me? Hear you. All right, that might be better since it's a 5G network. All right. Can everybody still hear me? Yes. Hold on. Sounds like a, okay. Um, meaning, I'm going to repeat that because I don't think anybody heard that. <laughs> Oh, God, I'm trying, guys. It's my bunker internet. What I was saying, and I'm going to say it slow, so if it, if, it, if it cuts, I'll just repeat it, is each word in your sentence doing brand new work. Um, one thing to watch for, and we can't help it because we do, everybody does it, is... Is your adjective doing the same work as your noun? Max, Max. Oh, sorry, guys. Max, here's a carrot. <laughs> um, meaning it's, it's, it's are, are, are your words doing double work? For example, people still say things like dark night or future plans or each individual, or end result, or terrible tragedy. You know, there's no, there's no mild tragedy. All tragedies are terrible. Various differences. Well, it's a fact that they're different why they're various. So what I'm saying is our, you know, you know it's, it's, it, it's our, our, all your sentence words doing New work. I also said divorce words that are long married. If you've seen the combination before, it probably you've seen it, it probably is cliche. So let this be the last time anybody describes somebody's hair as chestnut brown. I don't even know what a chestnut is. I'm from Jamaica. We don't have chestnuts. So <laughs> yeah. Um well, let me one sec. Let's see where I'm looking for. All right, let's get back to this. Because I, I want to get to the questions things. Because I'm sure some of you make come you got places to go. Um the, the 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 I think it's the fifth or sixth one. Steaks. Did not learn not the food. Did not learn that. What is at stake in your story? What is it that your characters can't afford to lose? Stakes don't necessarily mean life and death. Stakes can be your four, your sister is three, there's one cookie on the table, and I'm going to get it, damn it. Or else there is war. That is stakes, because it's going to be World War III if that gr girl eats all of that, gets that cookie before me. It's, um, it's not the subject matter. It's how much stakes are you putting in there. If, if you give a situation that your characters can easily just do something else, then there is no stakes. If your character can just as easily choose option B as option A, then we have nothing invested in, the cho in their choices. One of the things I do, and you don't have to do it, but it works for me, is, is I think of what I can afford to lose. I think of in my life, what is at stake? What I what would destroy me if I lose it? What I can't afford to give up, and I apply. I look for that feeling
Is everybody hearing me now? That was weird because I am not the host and somebody, <laughs> the host did something. I have no idea what that was. It was definitely not me. Okay, let's do this again. Um, or should we wait? I think, is everybody back? Looks that way. All right. Um, what was I talking? I was talking about stakes. Can everybody still hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. What? Think of what you can afford to lose. If I can't afford to lose my mom because she's getting older and I don't want her to go, um, how is that feel? How can I transfer that feeling to my character losing? your one shot at fame. Yeah. What we like are characters who have no choice. Characters who are pushed to their limit. Characters who have run out of options. Even if deep down they, they haven't. You know, and, and, and think about it. Think of, you know, as a writer, think of what, what can you hope, what, what situation can you push your character in? What, what kind of um, hole can you dig for them to fall in that they have to crawl their way out back out? And I mean, this is not necessarily melodrama, although I'm a big lover of melodrama. Um, it, 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 it can be the, you know, the quietly observed story. Um, I'm trying to think of what Alice Walker's story it was where the bulk of the story is the mother and daughter sitting out in the front yard waiting for waiting for her sister to show up and that really is a story yeah what is well what's at stake in that story they know that when this character comes memory comes when that character comes the incident that from the past that they don't want to talk about is coming with her it's we have this idyllic situation. We're sitting on the porch, drinking our lemonades, having a fine time, but Uncle George is coming. It's like that thunder in the back. So you see that stakes, stakes are coming. It doesn't have to be, Uncle George is not coming with a pickaxe. <laughs> you know, it's not Freddy Krueger around the back. It's just your sister. But the one who got married and thinks they have a perfect life and feels the need to share how wonderful their life is every flipping time they show up. Where, does it, where, where is the stakes coming from? Where is the tension coming from the, as the character is on their way there? So I'm saying that's what I mean about stakes. What is it that your character can't afford to lose? And give them that, give them that, um, that, that stakes. And stakes lead into the... Second to last one here, and I'm going to jump through it so we can have, have a good 20 minutes of questions. Tension. Um, a lot of stakes is involved. A lot of what we said about stakes also applies um, to tension. How do we create that uneasy feeling in a story? People shouldn't feel comfortable when you're reading your story. You shouldn't feel comfortable writing it. It should bother you a little bit too. It should tense you a little bit too. Your villains or your characters who are antagonists, you should hate them too. There's nothing wrong with hating a character. Not wrong with loving them, not wrong with hating them. It's when you're indifferent to them that you're in trouble. So what is you know, to come back to that that um that 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 line from a good man is hard to find. The grandmother didn't want to go to Florida. That's immediate tension from the, from the get-go. That's tension. One way is I, I use tension as a story is I don't give my characters anything. They want coffee. Yeah, want coffee? Screw you. The coffee is cold. They want to go to the store? Sorry, the car broke down. I don't give them anything. <laughs> they want to cross the street? Streets back, too many cars passing by. They want dinner, the dinner is, the, the, the fish is spoiled. I don't give them anything. What does that do? Before even the main plot of your story, uh, here's a carrot. <laughs> Before even the main plot of the story happens, 
the situation is already tense. Think about the, the loved one you live with or the loved ones you know, how much you love them, but the thing you can't stand. It's like, you're great, but if you leave that toilet seat up one more time, Max, you have to stop barking. I'm teaching a class. They can hear you. Anyway. Um, yeah, think of um, what, what is it that you can, the way in which you, you don't reward the character, the way in which you keep the tension, as I'm saying, going. Tension implies gratification, that we're going to have gratification soon. How long can you keep that going? And that is one of the things that, that you know, creates something great in the story. One thing we should not do, though, and, 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 and I've seen stories confuse this all the time, the difference between resolving tension and rewarding tension. Um, there's a scene in... In Game of Thrones, where one of the characters, um, I can't remember her name, she was being brutalized by Ramsey, setting his dogs on him. Hold on, my connection is bad again. All right, I think the connection came back. Uh, somebody's asking, is Max? Max, come here. <laughs> ah. You know, maybe you'll be here. There is Max. Max, say hi. <laughs> Max is like, give me a carrot. Okay, can you go now? Can I leave you? Can I finish my class? Hmm? <laughs> oh God, now he's spoiled rotten. He's gonna like bring me back up here now. Anyway, um, what I was saying about the Game of Thrones scene is the character took revenge. The, the, the victim took revenge on the villain, and that's fine, and it seems like it's okay, but it wasn't resolving the tension. It was merely rewarding it. We want to see a comeuppance, but you know life doesn't work that way. You might get what you want, but there is a price, or you didn't get quite what you want, or, you do, or nobody's rewarded. We just have to move on to the next day. Tension is resolved without um, rewarding. Um, the last thing I'm going to say. Before we get too exhausted is um, I'm thinking about tone in only one sense. Tone in the way in which you use tone to set up dialogue. What do I mean by that? Um, let's pull a, 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 an example. Macbeth Act 2 Scene 2. Uh, Macbeth has murdered Duncan. Uh, Macbeth comes into the room and Lady Macbeth is there and Lady Macbeth says, give me the daggers. Is it, give me the daggers, give me the daggers, or give me the daggers? <laughs> wow, that was a perfectly timed bark. Um, yeah, it's each one of those is a different meaning. If it's, give me the daggers, then Lady Macbeth is frustrated, is flustered. It's Max right now going, give me the carrot. Is it, if it's, give me the daggers, you're going to have to stop. Or I'm going to take you back outside. Come here. Max, you're overshadowing my class. I can't have you when I'm teaching every class. Okay, stand there. If it's, <laughs> if it's give me the daggers, then Lady Macbeth is asserting authority. It's not the same as being frustrated. It's like if, if two people are playing on a game console, I go, give me the, give me the, 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 I don't, the Game Boy. I'm like, yeah, give me a chance. If it's give me the daggers, then maybe Lady Macbeth is kind of bloodthirsty. It's the same sentence, but at, depending on where you stress it, it tells us a different thing about the character. Now, how do we establish that? That is where I bring up the whole thing about tone. I'm going to end with that. 
is whatever you put before that dialogue, that tells us how to read that. Otherwise, you'll do what some people do where you italicize the word you want to stress, or you put it in all caps, or you say things like, give me the daggers, she said annoyingly, or give me the daggers, she said lustily. Once you get to the point where you have to use a word like lustily, you're already in trouble. It's what is, it's this, it's whatever happens before we get to give me the daggers. So if, if, if we get in there and Lady Macbeth is already annoyed and like, I can't believe I got woken up over this piece of crap, then we know it's give me the daggers. If we establish that Macbeth is being too flighty, it's like, oh my God, I don't know what to do. Should I give, I don't know what to do with the daggers. Then she's like, give me the daggers. If we come into the room and all we know is Lady Macbeth see blood and all she's seen is blood everywhere, we know it's give me the daggers. So it's how you set up the scene, how you establish that tone that tells us how to read that. And that way you don't need punctuation. You don't need italics. You don't need that dreaded all caps. Max. <laughs> it's how you set up the scene that tells us how to, um, how to read it. Um, so that is, that are the things, that's what I, most of the things I have to talk about. Sorry for the crappy connection and Max trying to take over since he's a diva dog. But um, I think we have some time for questions. Anybody have questions? It doesn't have to be content. It doesn't have to pertain to anything I talked about. It could be one of those things that I wanted to ask a creative writing teacher, but haven't yet. Unless you just want industry gossip. Industry gossip. <laughs> oh, Lord, I don't know what's going on now. Who's being <laughs> fired now? I don't know. I have to think about it. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Yeah, um, yeah, I have one. So would you go back to flashbacks and elaborate a bit more? Why wouldn't we use them? I don't say we shouldn't use flashbacks. Um, I certainly use them a lot. I'm saying what happens sometimes with flashbacks is that the present tense isn't as interesting as the flashback. So it's not that you shouldn't use flashbacks or memory. It's if you're going to have a present tense that's different from the flashback, that has to be as interesting because the reader is on pause. If, I am, if, if, you're, if your character is driving somewhere and thinking about the place they just left, where they're driving to has to be as interesting as the place they just left. Or, or it doesn't have to be where they're driving to, you know, how they're feeling as they're driving. Maybe they're, maybe, you know, to use, if, to, to, to use the detective story trope, maybe the, he got shot. Maybe he's bleeding out. Maybe he's going to the one safe house he knows. What I'm saying is the present tense must be, should be as in interesting as what the characters remember or you end up with an uneven story interesting then right now if five minutes ago is interesting is that clear so it's not a, it's not a yet shouldn't use flashbacks but remember the present tense <laughs> um while you're doing it um I see, oh, you just wave your hand. Yeah. Yeah. I, is there any, any magical trick to, to pick up again a novel that I, here's my situation. I, there is a novel that I started quite a time ago. It isn't as, I'm quite fascinated by the story, but I have all the enthusiasm to write plays, but I have not continued with the novel. I want to. There is, I have written synopsis, uh, every character to the end of the earth, all of that, but I do not continue. Is there anything that I could do to break the logjam? Um, 
There are quite a few things you could do. Um, the first thing I would say is who's telling a story? And maybe what one thing you need, one thing to look at is change who's telling it. Okay. Um, you know, one thing, actually, I should turn on. Let me turn on the light because I think my room is getting darker and darker. One second, guys. Oops. Max, Naughty can all see you. Hi, Max. <laughs> uh, where'd my mic go? Hold on. Okay, you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so one thing to think of is who's telling the story? And maybe it's a, a point of view question. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes it's, it's actually um, the... the Who's telling the story and from what perspective are they telling it? Um, it could be that it's, yeah, that it's, it's especially if, if, it's a, if it's something you've worked on for a while and there's a kind of fatigue about it. Yes. Um, that it could be that a different, it, 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 what, it, what it's calling for is a different character's perspective, a, a different character in a story. Mm. You know? um, Chekhov does that sometimes quite a bit mm. where he will just, have this worldview and you're totally believing that worldview. And then at the last minute he switches to a kid. Mm. And I go, Oh crap. I didn't think about that. Mm. I didn't think that's how somebody else would have been seeing it all this time. Do, do you remember at all? Which one would it be? Um, that one I think is a trifle from real life. A what from real life? A trifle, T-R-I-F-L-E. Oh. Trifle from real life. But it's a short story. So when the, the point of view switches, it only switches for like a paragraph. That's fine. I, I left it off and I... Mm -hmm. I yeah. Left. Point of view is usually the first thing I, I think of. I also think of when I say about gaps and leaps, that one of the things may be that the story needs to jump a few years mm -hmm. or maybe a few decades. Mm. Yes. Um, and I think, yeah, I think, you know, I mean, I don't want to add another suggestion because point of view is just such a big thing in itself. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, yeah, think of, think of, um, somebody else. It could be that you're writing a story in third person and it needs to be in first, but not the person you typically would have it in first. Yeah. Or it could be you're writing it in first person and what's needed is something more omniscient. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The character can speak instead of me speaking for the character. Yeah. Um, because, you know, one of the things you have to also have to allow is eventually characters become people. Yeah. And those characters have different desires and different, you know, different worldviews than, than the, re you know, the reader, the viewer will, sorry, the viewer, the, the reader will have or the writer. Think of, um, does your character have to be reliable? Hmm. There are so many great unreliable narrators out there. The two people I thought of are Remains of the Day. Hmm. Um, Ford Maddox Ford's a good soldier, where he's the character is the only person who doesn't realize his wife is cheating on him. Everybody else knows, hmm. but the character who's telling the story. Okay. So, yeah, some things to, some I, things to think about. I like that. Mm hmm. Cool. Um, to, it was about, about like five minutes. Any more questions? Thanks. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Don't all go at once. <laughs> yeah. Dana? Um, thanks. Um, so talking about pulse, um, can there be too many, um, too much pulse? Work? Yes. God, I said that so loud. Can you tell I'm a victim of that? <laughs> there can be. It can be too much. Like sometimes that's the problem with melodrama. There's too much happening. And um and we feel we should just pack it, pack it, pack it with all sort of stuff. 
I won't. I'm not give a story room to breathe. Um, there, are the, but you see, pulse is also when do you moderate it? Um, when do you slow down? It's not just a matter of when do you rack up the tension. When do you slow it down? When are you gonna like? For example, how do you show that ten minutes has passed and people are waiting? Uh, that you have to slow down to show that it's like it's, it's uh, how you show the passage of time in a story or a paragraph you know you, you have what we some people say like they waited for a long time before they left that's yeah, that's not good enough what does the wait feel like what is happening during this wait is that the first time you notice that the person's tie is crooked mm. yeah so yeah there can be there can be too much pulse um, and it's a matter of it's a matter of varying. It's like when we talk about length of sentences. Some people just write long sentence of the long sentence of a long sentence, and then other people just write short sentence of the short sentence. It's varying the length. If you're writing something fast paced, chances are you need those short sentences. If you're if you're going to describe how beautiful a tree is, maybe you need one hundred words, one sentence. So it's variety that that um you know that that you know that keeps it going and makes it work so yes you're right you can you can be over you can overpack what you don't want is either overdoing it or underdoing it hey i'm trying to teach a class here yeah uh no more questions i think we have time for two more questions um how would you um I guess go about uh, a story or a play that you don't really know how how to end it, mm -hmm. um, but you need a climax and you need it to be dramatic, um, but you don't really know how to end it. What kind of questions do you think you should, I guess, ask yourself in order to successfully end um, something? Because I have a lot of problems with ending it. I can mm -hmm. write something, I can start an idea, but I have no idea how to finish it. That again, I, I, and, and I want people to realize, again, just in case I haven't stressed it hard enough, most of what I'm saying are not hard and fast rules because even that question made me think of two different answers. So it's not a hard and fast rule. One thing I think to consider is maybe it doesn't end, maybe it stops. That there are a lot of um, great stories. I'm thinking of, what did I think of? Um, is it William Golding's The Inheritors? Um, or some plays that you might have seen. Um, Strange Loop, which is a fantastic play. Uh, so um, I hope it comes back. I hope it comes on Broadway. It's, one, it's, the, be, it's the greatest thing I saw in 2020. I thought 2019. I thought it was the greatest cultural experience. But anyway, that's the best. <laughs> sorry? It's the best. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. But some of those stories don't end, they stop. And by stop, I mean. This isn't resolved because life is that way sometimes. Um, one of the great things about um, um, Tommy Orange is there, there. It also doesn't end. It stops. So that's one thing to think about. Now let's go on the other side. Um, is everything, uh, somebody else was the title of the play, Strange Loop, like that Liz Fair song, which it's actually based on. Um, all right, Max, I'm going to put you down. Go destroy a toy or something. Um, the other thing is, is to think about is, is enough in your story resolved? One reason why it cannot, maybe it's not ending is that it's, this, is that it's not being stopped at. It's not being resolved. So, so before we even think endings, um, go back and look at resolutions. Like what are, and a resolution can be two things. It can be, um, not a resolution, sorry, a denomar rather. What's the, hold on, see my connection is unstable. Let's wait, okay, I think it's back. Am I back? Okay, yeah, think about um, what are, what are the, the if, if there is still stuff left behind, then maybe the story, the reason why it can't end is the story isn't resolved yet. Or some of the characters that, that it is around. And resolve don't necessarily mean it's tied up. The result, the resolution can be, we're not going to fix this. Uh, or the resolution can be, we're just going to go move apart. Um, the third reason 
why, and this may not apply to you, but it sure as hell applied to me, is I don't want to let go. <laughs> and Max Bark has it for emphasis. You know, that for me is, is one of why I, I have problems ending to, I, I, I have problems ending a story. And for me, a lot of times I just don't want to let go. I think maybe there's something else. And what I find is I will keep writing towards this end and then a week later, realize, you know, it, you know, it ended back here. So sometimes when, if, if, if there isn't an ending, just continue. You know, and um, because it will, it, it will tell you. You will know when, you will know when the story has reached a point where you have nothing new to say. And when you get to that point, that is the ending. And don't be afraid of a messy ending. You know, don't be afraid of a messy ending, an abrupt ending. I think people feel endings must be profound. It's like. Yeah, Tony Morrison's Sulo, you know, that is a fantastic ending. Um, you know, God, can she end a story? But some endings are better. Some endings don't end like that. Disgrace doesn't end like that. Disgrace is a man, a mediocre man in a mediocre job realizing, you know what? All I have is a mediocre tomorrow. Where is the next patient? And that's his end. It's, it's, it's a thoroughly unrewarding. And that's the point. So that's the thing. Ending, we sometimes put the same pressure on endings that we put on beginnings. We must start with a bang. We must be certain such. No, just begin. And and the ending, yeah, eventually the story, you know, will tell you what the ending is. All right, guys. I think that is that is it. I think I had a camera was supposed to be an hour, and I kept you guys over by a half hour. And my dog is constantly barking. You weren't you fed? Huh? Come say goodbye to these wonderful people. Max, say goodbye. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, I think there is another talk. I'm not sure when it is. I'd have to check with with Theo. And I think that one may be a more general um, talk or so on. But in the meantime, if you guys have any any questions and so on, by all means, send them to me, send them to Theo and so on. And we could probably set up another session where all we do is just sort of respond to questions. It becomes a kind of a workshop thingy. Yeah, okay. All right, everyone and Noel. I'll see you guys really soon. Thank you, Marlon. Right. Somebody said something, list of books you recommend. I'm gonna have to email that to you guys. Or is that going to take another hour? Okay. I'll wait. All right, guys. So Peace talk to you again pretty soon. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Saturday. 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 <laughs> <laughs>